Hello, my name is Dr. Michael Glass. I'm the Regional Studies Association's Territorial Chair for the United States. The Regional Studies Association is a learned society concerned with the analysis of regions and regional issues. Through our international membership, we provide an authoritative voice for and network of academics, students, practitioners, and policymakers. You can find out more about the Regional Studies Association, including information on membership, funding opportunities, and events at regionalstudies.org. I'm pleased to present a new installment of our Regionalists on Film series that introduces you to the work of established and emerging regional scholars and their scholarship. Today, it's my special privilege to introduce Professor Erika Schoenberger. Dr. Schoenberger is Professor of Environmental Health and Engineering at the Whiting School of Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. An economic geographer and environmental historian, Schoenberger is the author of Nature, Choice, and Social Power, which explores how different forms of social power, including the power of markets, create and sustain pollution problems. Her current research delves into the origins of capitalism, and she was awarded a 2020 Guggenheim Fellowship for her book, A Recognition of Achievements and Exceptional Promise in Scholarship or Creative Arts. Erica, welcome. Thanks, I'm flattered to death to be here. Now, um, maybe we could start by um, talking a little bit about your background and how you first became interested in researching regions and regional development. Huh. Okay, so, um, so I spent a few years out of uh, university life after I graduated college, and I was very involved in kind of anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist politics. We used to call it movement work. And that's very global. Uh, it's you know very international, and I had <clears throat> fantasies of you know leading the revolution like everybody else, and that didn't work out. And so I decided to go local, and I applied to this program in city and regional planning because I wanted a quickie professional degree so that I could be a community organizer. Then. Luckily for communities everywhere, I realized I'd be a really rotten community organizer and I stayed and got more serious. And so the reason that I got interested in regions as opposed to everything, um, it, Anne Markison and Doreen Massey basically um, opened my eyes to the both the importance, but also the possibilities for thinking and working and maybe making changes about how we thought about regions and how they develop. So that's the that's the answer. It was a particularly fertile time at Berkeley when you were there for regional scholarship, wasn't it? It was fantastic. I mean, we left up big time. There was a cohort of graduate students in geography and planning um, that were really part of a shared project, um, radicalizing planning and geography. And professors like Anne and like Dick Walker, who were right there with us. And we did all sorts of stuff together. We um, took over the planning network newsletter for a while, uh, back in the days when you had to type up labels and staple the you know thing closed. Um, but we had a great time together and it was kind of exhilarating to be with this group and all of us striving to work sort of in the same direction. It's a lot of fun. And I, I think that um, the, the paper that you and Mark Weiss put together in memory of Peter Hall, Sir Peter Hall, um, does a nice job of talking about some of the, the strands that went out from that network, right? Yeah, um, we all kind of went in different directions. Uh, we kept more or less in touch. We see each other at regional science meetings and places like that. Um, and the influences continue to percolate. It was a great group of people, um, and I've only named some of them, um, but I feel like I lucked up big time, especially since I was kind of a newbie to the whole idea of graduate school. And when I got to Berkeley, I was kind of scandalized that there were people getting PhDs in geography because I still thought of it as, you know, the four largest rivers. And then, and they were all kind of drifting about talking about space. And I thought that was kind of frou-frou. Um, and then, then I saw the point, and I uh, transformed. Well, well, let's talk about that point because while your work is interdisciplinary, uh, you are closely associated with geography and especially economic geography. Uh, from from that 
<laughs> initial impression of what geography was. Um, how did the ge and geographic tradition contribute to your scholarship? Well, you know, in a, in a million ways, and I have become a geographer. That's really what I think of myself um, as. Um, and part of the reason I love it, it's kind of the undiscipline. It's, it's not so much that I'm interdisciplinary, it's that I'm undisciplined, and that means you can go anywhere and do anything you like, uh, which, which is nice. But I also lived in a department that really fostered that kind of freedom, which I am also eternally grateful for. Um, so, you know, I'd always read political economy, you know, like I'd already read Ball one through three of Marx and Braverman and uh, Baran and Swayze by the time I got to grad school. And, um, and then the, the question is, how do you find geography? And at Berkeley, it was Dick Walker and Michael Watts, of course. Um, and so that even though I was in the planning program still, I, um, I latched on to Dick, who has been um, just a wonderful supporter ever since. And he helped me come to Hopkins, where I found David Harvey. So, uh, you know, it was perfect for me. I was already Marxy. I was becoming a geographer. And pow, there's David. And uh, you couldn't have asked for a better um, place to land. And so that's how I became a geographer. I was always political econ, okay, that, that was me from the start. So economic geography and um, ur the urban, uh, just the whole enchilada, um, to coin a phrase. And, uh, and I found that it that it was everything that I needed. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> you know, one of the reasons that I like it so much is, um, is that you can ask questions that other disciplines don't ask. A geographic sensibility tunes you into um, processes and dynamics and places that historians or sociologists or economists don't think about. And they're wrong not to think about it because it makes a big difference when you think about it. So, <clears throat> um, so you know, if you just add in to any history of any place or the economics of any place, what does it take to move resources from here to there? Simple question. Um, I've been in rooms full of historians where I've said, "Well, how you know how do you get from here to there?" And everybody goes, "Oh." <laughs> You know, it's like a, a, a question from the sky that hits them on the, on the top of the head. So um, how, do you, how do places come into being? How do you construct a new place? How do you construct a new landscape, uh, an economic and environmental landscape? How do you construct a new reality? It's geography all the way down. Uh, by which I don't mean, God forbid, uh, uh, geographic determinism, but if you leave it out, you don't get the story right. That's it's right. it's the whys of where. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now, along with the whys it's of the whys where. of where, but the whys are very much about agents who actually go out and do things in the where, and the kind of broad structural um, processes that are pushing them in one or the other direction. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the issue of agency is always present in your work, whether it's it's pieces on uh, corporate interviewing, or whether it's the ways in which uh, uh, ways in which environmental in, environmental degradation comes about. Yeah. Um, a lot of your work, and, and I think about the the piece that you wrote a few years ago with Dick Walker in Journal of Economic Geography. Um, you, you're reminding us to take history seriously, um, along with all of, uh, of those themes that that are present in your work, whether it's. Yeah environmental degradation or war or city region development. Um, along with, with the geographic dimension, what is it about um, uh, the focus on, on a historic element that, that matters? Why should, why should we attend to the temporal as well as to the spatial? Well, I think that it's also because if you don't know the history, you get it wrong. You get the geography wrong. So I'm very much in you know, sort of thinking from within a geographic 
historic um, frame, throw in a little bit of anthropology, um, and and that's me. Um, so I think that um, that geographers and regional scientists, in a way, sell themselves short by not taking history very seriously. We have the habit of, you know, we have a little potted history at the beginning of every article that we write. Uh, you know, here's a potted history of Detroit, here's one of Barcelona, but we, we don't really um, write about or think about um, the kind of deep, complicated historical roots of these stories. Not that you have to reproduce them all the time, but you should know them and that should inform your writing. It should inform the kind of questions that you're gonna ask of the material you're working with. So um, if, uh, if, you know, if I could talk about the current project a little bit. Sure. It's really on the um, historical origins of capitalism, a kind of rewrite of them. So, you know, it's all about, um, well, first of all, it takes place in, you know, like the 16th century um, where it bursts out onto the scene. And I'm gonna take it back uh, to mid and late middle ages. Not to say that capitalism started there, but that the social and economic and physical infrastructure of capitalism was laid down there, um, sort of ready-made for when actual capitalists emerge on the scene. And, um, and the way I'm writing is very much against the idea that markets emerge out of generations of anonymous individuals pursuing their own self-interest and that towns emerged in the same way, sort of individuals nameless optimizing their own um, lives. And I'm gonna argue that, um, that that's not the way towns and markets came into being, that the way they came into being, or let's ask who needs money and if they need money, where do they get it? And, the, and so who needs money is the ruling class because they're pretty much constantly at war. All they do is beat each other up and, um, and they need to move resources around in order to do that. Uh, you know, you have to go invade Gascony or you have to go on a crusade. And that means, you know, if you're a crusader, you need to liquidate resources that you have in England land and, uh, and have enough money to go for three or four years to the Holy Land and back if you come back. And so, um, so all sorts of new credit um, arrangements are devised in order to allow this to happen. But what I argue is that people who are constantly at war, people who um, make these projects of going across country and killing other people, um, are the ones who need money. The peasants don't need money except for this one use, which is to pay taxes and rents. And that's what the ruling class people that I'm talking about, also sort of princes of the church, they need money. They need liquidity in order to do this geographical stuff and um, geographical and historical stuff. And you know, so where do you get money? You get it from markets. And where do you find markets? You find them in towns. And so these very people who are warring with each other and who need money in order to do it, set up the markets and the towns. You could say that markets grow up around armies because you have to keep the whole thing going or you have to support them in place if they're garrisoned someplace. Um, you need uh, markets to get you money in order to do the war fighting or the you know collecting um, indulgences for purgatory. Incidentally, one of the best business models ever invented, you know, monetizing the soul that you can't lose. Um, so so the, um, the direction of causation I'm saying is not money gives you markets and markets need towns. It's that ruling class people establish towns in order to have markets in order to get money. And, um, and that means you're starting to produce some of the essential infrastructure of 
cap which will later become capitalism. I'm making no claims that it happens in you know the 14th century. Um, so, and I mean this literally that the um, king, the aristocrats, the bishops, the uh, abbots actually sighted towns. They laid out the grid. They platted them. They stocked them with people of their own affinities. And they gave some of those people um, burgesses, the plot that they could more or less own. They could subdivide it, they could rent it out, they could sell it. And those burgage plots were inhabited by burgesses, bourgeois, who became a kind of urban patriciate and who gained a lot of um, control over their own political circumstances. So totally top down, totally not an anonymous, totally not emergent here. I want a city here or a town here because I want to you know, have a place where these miserable peasants can come and uh, sell stuff. They weren't necessarily selling in order to buy. It was not a market logic. It was a military logic and a financial logic. Um, and uh, and then I take all the money and I go make war with it, or I go build a monastery or a cathedral with it. The ruling class had plenty of ways of spelling, spending money, and they needed a lot of it. So that's so so it's that kind of geographical sensibility that allows me to ask questions that medieval historians don't ask. They just don't ask it and they don't read each other. <laughs> so yeah. the economic historians don't read the military historians and vice versa. And because I'm the undisciplined, um, I read all of them. And through the eyes of a geographer and because I am kind of OCD, <laughs> I um, can see the field in a different way. I mean, the terrain and the um, scholarly field in a different way. And that has made a lot, meant a lot to me. Um, so this project is not so much about the environment per se, although it's changing the landscape. And when you create the preconditions for capitalism, you can be sure that massive environmental change is gonna follow. Um, so that's kind of the, va the value of a geographic sensibility to, in my case, for my work. You mentioned Gascony. Are there other um, sites or people that you're very excited about um, showcasing uh, through that particular project? I'm sticking to England because that's really where it all began. And once England becomes capitalist, then you know other places can become capitalist. But it's the world has already changed, and they're becoming capitalist under different circumstances. So I really wanted to focus on England, where you know that's the sort of origin of everything. And also because it's taken me 10 years to get this far. And if I start on Gascony, I'm gonna be, you know, dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's hope not. Now, um, as, as you're working on this project and as, as you're thinking about the state of regional scholarship in uh, general, what else do you see as the opportunities or the challenges that regional scholars can address? I'm thinking a couple of things. One is obviously that I think we should bring more serious history into it. Even if you're not writing history, I think it makes a difference if you look a little deeper than we do. So for example, why does Silicon Valley exist? And part of the answer is, or part of the question is, who has a problem with vacuum tubes? And the answer is only the defense department. They are the ones who are about to put missiles and satellites up in the sky, and they need very, very teeny tiny things not, that will not you know, blow out. And so that's where the semiconductor industry comes from, 100%, okay? No defense department and no state, nothing, until maybe, uh, you know, eventually it would all have happened, I suppose, but not in a concentrated way, not where it did, it did necessarily, and not when it did. So, um, and who has the need for this stuff um, that is big enough to bring an entire industry into being? The state. It's not people who are gonna be buying smartphones. You need this massive, massive presence 
big enough to create a market and to alter the economic landscape for all time. Um, and that's what the state did during World War II when it, I mean, it like tripled or quadrupled the size of the aircraft industry and shoved all the investment west and south. So, you know, bingo, that's, that's where it comes from. And that's what you have to build on in the post-war period. Um, so, you know, the stories that we tell ourselves that, you know, for example, start with Stanford. Why did Lockheed Missiles in Space, which was the biggest employer at the time and up until quite recently, I think, um, in the Valley, and that had all of these, that was, you know, that encapsulated the need for all these transistors and semiconductors. Um, why did they move to um, uh, uh, Sunnyvale? Was it because of Stanford? Or was it because of how great the engineering school was at Stanford? No. They, uh, what they really liked about Stanford was that its aerospace engineering program was kind of weak. And they sort of took it over and they supplied the professors and they supplied the students and they recreated the department in their own image. So that was the val because otherwise they could have gone to Berkeley, which was um, in charge of the nuclear weapons design program. You know, so, so it was more the weaknesses of Stanford than its strength. And since um, uh, Lockheed moved there in 1956 and you know, Fairchild Semiconductor moved there in 1957, it's just a crucial, crucial turning point for the Valley um, and, um, uh, and you don't get it right if you don't see the role of the state. You don't get it right if you don't see how the state is um, integrated with the private sector as they go about creating um, an economic landscape, which seems to me really, really super important. And even you know when we get to the sort of cultural aspects of Silicon Valley, which you know are are very well um, uh, analyzed by Anna Saxenian, you can you can probe in that history because the um, the military contractors who were the origins really of Silicon Valley um, have a very particular culture which is not at all like. Um, the culture we associate with modern Silicon Valley. It's a culture of secrecy. Um, talking with these guys 40 years after, um, after the first satellite went up, you'd ask them a question and, and there would be a pause and you could sort of see them going, uh, is this a security problem? And then they decide no, and then they would, would answer it. So there's an interesting story somehow to be told about how that culture changed. Uh, maybe not, you know, a story that you need to, to tell and I'm not gonna tell it, but I bet there's an interesting story there nonetheless. The kind of, you know, as you're transferring or as you're moving from the, um, the Defense Department substrate into consumer stuff, although defense is still totally important there, you're also moving um, away from the behemoth companies like Lockheed. You're moving away from the um, def defense culture into um, a different kind of culture. So I don't know. It, it I, I think what, it what it speaks to is a, a, a need to, to uh, retain a sense of the individual agency along with what can sometimes be overdetermined accounts of, of yeah. regional structures and, and evolution. Yeah, and the particulars uh, right. really matter a lot. You know, it's uh, Lockheed changed the whole place. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, so did Xerox Park, and Xerox Park worked in different ways. Um, but uh, Lockheed just you know, came with a thud, and um, and there, a whole lot of stuff grew up around it. Right. Well, thank you. Now, that's all the time we have to uh, talk today with Erica, but I'd like to thank you for joining us and to share your, uh, your perspective on regional scholarship. Um, I'd also like to encourage all of you watching uh, to learn more about regional studies in the Regional Studies Association at regionalstudies.org. Um, Erica, would you care to have the last word today? Go oh, regional studies. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you.